how you try to put in uh, poetry. Uh, I, I hate this word in language, just use it as a tool, but it's technical and we have to, to, to do with it anyway. But uh, uh, I think uh, if you have Europe and, 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 and America, what shocked me when I first got there was how, what a great audience a poet can have there. Huge uh, amphitheaters, universities packed with, with students and professors, and of, of course, not only some poets too, who, who, who come there to, to, to learn creative writing with a famous poet and so But what's so beautiful, it's their attentiveness. You feel so connected. I, it, it's a, I, I feel so rewarded and full of energy when I return from there. Because, and that's what Europe should learn from, from, from them. Because uh, Dama Joya, the famous American poet and uh, critic, you know, he was a banker, he used to uh, work for a bank and so, and then the great change that threw up everything, he blew up everything, and he just stayed a poet. And he wrote a very interesting po uh, book on poetry and the role of poetry. And he says this, and that's good for any country, I think, and continent, is or culture. He says, if God took away the great audiences from the American poets, instead he gave them back universities. And that's true. Because they, they are the ones who invented creative writing. They are the ones who, who, uh, uh, who manage to teach poetry. Because it's, it's such a life thing, poetry. You can't actually describe and take to pieces like an engine of a car, the, uh, uh, the poem. I like what the French uh, lady said today, that uh, uh, you know, she, she doesn't want to ask ever somebody, uh, you know, describe this poem, talk about the scent, like in a school book, what they usually do. It's like a dead art poetry, the way they teach it and, and do it. You have, it's an alive thing. It's something so loaded with life and energy that you can't explain it. You just must let's taste it and feel it. And that is what you, you, you give poems to, to, to very young people, to, to, to schools. They studied this in high school in the States. But I think the great audience is in universities. And that's preparing the, the next generations for, for the love of poetry and for creation. Poetry has, hasn't changed much for 2,000 years or 3,000 years. And I don't think, of course, it's this comparison with you, you, you travel in a, in a horse uh, cart, right? Or poets of the 19th century, and poets of the 20th or 21st century traveling in, uh, on motorbikes, motorcycles, how did that, it's, I don't know, that's too slow, I think. You need a, a very strong vehicle or airplanes. Of course we have internet, we have TV, we have uh, uh, text messaging, we have all this uh, uh, new media and so. But poetry, it's so self-sufficient. It doesn't really need it, and I saw it. In, 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 in rooms, packs with, po with, with people, and the poem is, is like, a, like, a, it's like, a, you know, it's like a splendid nude. It doesn't need any special dresses, it doesn't need any special, uh, 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 I don't know, environment or so. It's self-sufficient. That's my opinion. <laughs> you could say maybe you, you think I'm old-fashioned, I don't know, but that's what I felt, that's what I've seen for the past 20 years while traveling and having uh, poetry readings all over the world, and I think poetry still connects, connects with people. Even if you have a small audience, doesn't matter if you touch two souls in that audience, you can, you can be a happy person, happy poet. You don't have to reach the big audiences, but when you reach them, then it's really a most fantastic feeling to see all these young people, 19, 20, that, that come and listen and it's such a, such a silence and they have wonderful questions. So they weren't there like just sitting and listening. But you see that it went through their hearts, you know. And I think that's what would happen. We don't have, we are too old in Europe, I think. We need this, this infusion uh, of, um, of, um, of the love for, for the word, for the word as, as it is, you know. The word and the word which is such a, such a fantastic means of transportation. And then I'll, uh, I'll end up with this. I was teaching about metaphors, you know, and I went to Greece and I was in the Athens airport and I was telling my students, listen, I was there and I was just got off the plane, I was alone, and suddenly this man comes to me, uh, you know, full of smiles and crying to me, hey, metaphora, metaphora, I said, how does he know I'm a poet? I just got off the plane, do I look like a poet or something? What is it? And then again he came to me, metaphora, metaphora. 
And then, I, and then he showed me his, his little car, you know, carrier, because a metaphora in Greek means that small means of transportation. It's like a little uh, cart you have in airports where you put your luggage <laughs> in suitcases. And that's exactly what the metaphor is, right? It carries you from one place into another. That's a metaphora. <laughs> so so uh, life is full of poetry, I tell you. You just have to keep your eyes open. And, and smell it and feel it. And I think everybody is a, is a poet, at least once in life, when, 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 when you're in love, especially the first love. I think that's like smallpox. Everybody, yes? You must admit, how many of you have written at least one poem in your life? Please be sincere and put, on, put up, up your hands. One, one poem. Just a poem. One, two, three. Well, you're not in love at 16 or 15. <laughs>